In this video, you're going to learn to sketch the graph of a derived function, which is just another way of saying sketching the graph of the derivative of a function. So we're used to sketching the graph of a function, like these guys here, and the reason that we do that is to learn some kind of information about the function, to discover some of its properties. So for example, this quadratic function, which makes this parabolic shaped graph, just by looking at the, that graph, we already know the turning point, which is an important point in terms of the, the function's behavior. We know that it's decreasing here, increasing here. We can see the root points, which are key points on this graph, and then we can see the y-intercept. So just by sketching that graph, we've already got a bunch of information about the function. But another way we can learn about a function is by sketching its derived graph, the graph of its derivative. So it's a bit of a weird concept, this at first, and it's not something that we're used to. You need to kind of switch your thinking when you go to the graph of the derived function. So we're just going to explore the idea by running through these three examples and just learning the technique of sketching the graph of a derived function. We're not going to look at why you might want to do that or look at the applications of that. That might be something you'll look at later, but we're just going to practice and learn the technique. So it doesn't really matter what type of function you're dealing with here, but typically these will be polynomial functions in this question type. So this is a quartic function, one that I just made up. This is a quadratic function making that usual parabola graph, and this is a cubic function making a usual cubic shape. Often in these questions, the functions are just made up. They're not actual functions, like there's no function given here, it's just some generic f of x function, and that works absolutely fine. It doesn't really matter if you have the the formula if you know algebraically what the function is or not. Typically you'll not be given that information in a question like this. Okay, so there's a little bit of theory that we need to unpack before we get into this and let's actually just work that into our first example. So here we've got this cubic function and notice that the points that have been highlighted here are the stationary points. So we don't know the function itself, we don't know the roots, we don't know the y-intercept, we just know the stationary points and we can see obviously the graph of the function. So what we want to do is to take that graph, the information that's in that graph, and kind of project it down onto the graph of the derivative. So what does that even mean? Well, what it means primarily is that instead of a graph where you've got x horizontally and y vertically, now you're going to have well, still x horizontally, but you're going to have the derivative, so f prime or f dash of x uh, vertically, or you could write that as uh, dy dx. So basically we're measuring not the y values on this vertical axis, but we're measuring the, the derivative. So that's the first and the most confusing thing about these questions. You're no longer measuring x, y, as in like a point in space. You're measuring x and then the derivative at that point of x. How do we even start to think about, you know, taking this graph down onto that? Well, you focus on the stationary points. Like these questions are all about those turning points, those stationary points. So let's take a look at this guy, first of all. So minus two, four. The only thing that really matters is the x coordinate. So if you think about the graph of this function, it's increasing here, it goes stationary, decreasing, stationary again, then increasing. What does that all really mean? Well, it means that over here, the derivative is positive. At the stationary point, it goes to zero. Then it's negative as the graph goes down the way, so it's decreasing. Then it goes to zero again at the stationary point, and then it goes back to positive increasing here. So remember, stationary points are just a place where the derivative goes to zero. Or in other words, the tangent line of the graph as you spin around would be horizontal at that point, so a zero gradient. That's the main thing that we need to know about to sketch these derivative graphs, these derived graphs. So at this point here, the stationary point, the derivative is zero. That means that on our derived graph, that point has to be on the x-axis because above the x-axis are all the, the positive f dash x values and down here below are all the negatives. Anywhere along the x-axis, you're measuring the derivative at zero. Okay, so positive above, zero on the x, and then negative below. So that's how you need to switch your thinking. That vertical axis is now measuring the derivative. It's measuring it precisely as a number. We don't care about the number. We just really care whether it's positive, zero, or negative. So start by marking on your stationary points. This point has got an x coordinate of minus two. It's got a derivative of zero. So you're gonna get the point minus two, zero. So we mark that one there. 
This is also a stationary point, it's got a derivative of 0, it's at x equals 3, so we go along to x equals 3 and we just mark it again on the, the horizontal axis which is measuring a 0 uh, derivative or a 0 gradient. How do we then fill in the shape? Well, positive here, negative here, positive here. Positive means the graph's going up in the actual function graph, in here, in the derivative graph, it means it's got to be positive above the x-axis. So that part of the graph needs to be up here somewhere. Between the two stationary points, it's negative. That means that part of the graph's got to be below the x-axis. It goes back to positive here. So anywhere to the right of that point, it's got to be back above. So it's above, below, and above. Doesn't take too much figuring out to realize that the shape you're then looking for is above to there then it goes below between the stationary points and then it goes back above. So here, positive, derivative. In this zone here, it's negative and then it's back to positive. But notice another interesting thing there. So this function here was a cubic function. So it's not written anywhere, but it is a cubic function, which means it contains an x cubed term. That's really what defines that function. This one here has ended up being a parabola graph, which is what you get for a quadratic function, which is an x squared term. So that's the other thing that always happens in these questions. You power down your graph type by one. So that's called the order of the graph or the order of the function. This is an order three function. This is an order two. That's what we should expect though, because when you differentiate, you multiply by the power using the power rule and you reduce the power by one. So a power of 3 in the actual function would go down to a power of 2. So in other words, when you sketch these derived graphs, you're always sketching one order below. So a cubic becomes a parabola. A parabola should become an order 1 function, which is a straight line. A quartic should become a cubic and stuff like that. So having that expectation that it should power down by 1 and give you one order below already helps you to figure out what the graph should look like. So all about the stationary points. Let's have a go at another one. So we already now know that this should come out to be a straight line. Let's just work through and see what happens. So we've got x here, and then on the vertical axis, we're measuring the derivative. Let's use f prime of x for that. Stationary point here, there is only one. It's at four. So if you go four along, you could even draw these like above, directly above and below each other. So you could just pull that point down. Um, so that's going to be at four along the way. One thing I should have said over here, I was a little bit sloppy with that, I should have marked these points on. So that should be at 3, 0, and then that should be at minus 2, 0. That's actually really important. You need to do that. And um, you don't need to worry about marking on any other points. Notice that we never used like the roots here or the y-intercept. It's all really just about getting the stationary points. There is only one here, so we've marked it on. Um, we've drawn it on and we're going to uh, mark it on in a second. So here the graph is going down the way, it's decreasing, so negative derivative, negative gradient at the stationary point is zero. Over here it's sloping up, so positive derivative, positive gradient. So we need negative anywhere to the left of this point, positive anywhere to the right. Negative is below, below the x-axis, positive is above. This is a power of two function, an x squared it should go down to a power of 1 after you differentiate. A power of 1 is a straight line, that's a linear function. So we're basically looking at a function that goes up like this. So it's negative here, 0 at the stationary point, and positive here, just reflecting where the gradient is. So anywhere along there on the original graph has got a negative gradient, which would be reflected in the, the gradient here. Uh, in the, the sort of uh, the numbers here, and then zero at the stationary point, and then positive uh, back uh, over there. Okay, so again, just marking on the point. So this point would be at uh, four and uh, zero. So four zero. So just pulling that stationary point down. So one thing to be slightly um, careful with here is that you don't get confused between like the stationary points and the roots for example and that's highlighted in the next question so this is a different type of function this would be a power of four function to a quartic function they can make all sorts of weird shaped graphs they quite often have different types of stationary points so this one here is a stationary point but it's not a turning point it's a point of inflection so it's a rising point of inflection this one here is a, a maximum turning point notice on this sketch that root here at 6, 0 is also highlighted. So sometimes in this question type, they will add in stuff you don't need. So for example, if this point here had been marked on, say that point was at um, like 6, 0, 
I like that one there. That's not relevant because it's not a stationary point. So we don't actually need this one here. So be careful not to use those points that you don't need. That's a common trick that um, will go into these questions to catch students out and it often does. So be careful with that. So just working this one up again, we're gonna use the horizontal as our X and the vertical as our uh, F dash X. Marking on our stationary points. It doesn't matter at the moment that this one's a point of inflection. We just mark it down so it's gonna have uh, a point on its derived graph at minus five, zero. Okay, so just there again, stationary point at two, four becomes at two, zero, so we can mark those on. And again, just working the whole positive, negative, derivative thing, that's really what these are about. So positive there, zero at the stationary point. Point of inflection means that it carries on up or it could carry on down, so positive, zero, positive, and then hits that stationary point where the derivative goes zero, and then it's negative everywhere after that. So here, to the left of this point, it should be above the x-axis because it's positive and to the right of it between that one and the next stationary point, okay? So it has to be above here and it also has to be above between the two points. So if it comes down here to this point, it can't dip below because then between the two stationary points, we would be in the negatives, but it's not negative, it's still positive. So that means the only option would be that it comes down here and this turn, this is a turning point, it turns here and then stays above the x-axis between those two points. After it goes through that point, the graph turns down, the derivative or the gradient goes negative, meaning that we go back negative. So piecing it all together, and it's not easy, it'll take a bit of experience and practice, Piecing that together though, our graph has to go down something like that and turn on that point and then curve round back through that point and give you something roughly like that. So that here you've got um, a positive gradient or derivative zero at the stationary point, still positive here. And notice that we're not talking about the gradient of this line. So the fact that that line itself is sloping down doesn't give us a negative here. I'm talking negative in the sense of being below or above the, the x-axis. So this positive, positive corresponds to that positive, positive. And then it goes negative uh, over here. But notice as well, the uh, quartic function, if you power that down by differentiation, that would go down to a, a, a cubic um, term, a, an x cubed term. So it's giving you a shape like this one, which is what we'd expect. Okay, this one goes the other way, but this would be like a pretty classic x cubed cubic function type. So that's really important, just knowing what type of function you're dealing with. If you've already studied polynomials and calculus to some extent, you'll probably recognize some of these graphs and just knowing that you should be getting a derived graph, which is one power uh, less, can be really helpful in giving you that expectation. So it's a weird technique. It takes a little bit of like twisting your thought process because you're so used to drawing x, y graphs. Now it's x, f prime of x, it will take practice, you will get confused, everyone does, it can be really confusing. The absolute key though, without a doubt, and the main takeaway from this class is to focus on the stationary points. That is the key, that is the starting point with these questions, you just mark those on onto the derived graph and then you fill in the shape from there. Pretty common question type in any course that contains calculus, uh, differentiation in particular. So if you're taking a course that does contain that, you should probably expect to have to deal with one of these questions at some point, but probably not more than one. It's a small technique, not massively important, but all the marks are important. So if you've got one of these in a test, or you suspect you will, then just work a few questions and you'll probably get this technique down pretty quickly. So I hope that that instruction is helpful and I hope that makes sense. If you've got any questions or comments, just leave them in the box below.